Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to take a look at this, the DC Roma RISC-V Laptop 2. Now, in case you're not aware, RISC-V is a free and open instruction set architecture, or ISA, that provides an alternative to the closed ISAs used in today's x86 and ARM CPUs. So this is a very exciting piece of hardware, which, as it says on the end of the box, is turning RISC-V into reality. And indeed, this is the first mobile device I've ever looked at with a RISC-V processor. Now, just before we continue, I want to make it clear that unlike the vast majority of hardware I show you on this channel, I have not purchased this laptop. Rather, this has been loaned to me by Deep Computing. But they haven't paid me in any way to make this video, they've not told me what to say, so this is not sponsored content, and indeed I'll be returning this to Deep Computing in a few days' time. So, with that hopefully clear, let's go and take a closer look. Right, here we have our RISC-V laptop, so let's open it up. I think we'll just swizz it round and uh, probably lift it like that. That's right, so I can now get in here, lift up the thingy, and uh, standard kind of box, I can get in here. Okay, and oh, here we are. Let's put that down on the floor. And this is what I think they call the development toolkit. We'll look at that a bit later on. And yes, this is the laptop. There is a no charger included here. It charges via USB-C, requiring a USB-C adapter with a 20 volt output. But uh, let's ignore that for now. Let's get on with the laptop. It's a long time since I opened up a new laptop and uh, this is very nicely packed. There we are. And uh, this hopefully just lifts, does it? Yes, it is slowly coming up and there we are. Ooh, laptop. How do I get this out? I lift that. And uh, come on, yes, there we are. Let's get rid of another bit of box. And it's, it's, it's blue, brushed aluminium. Very nice indeed. This is our DC Roma RISC-V laptop too. And if you're wondering, there was a DC Roma one before it, and this new model we have here is a lot cheaper and also more powerful. Specifically, this new RISC-V laptop is based on an octa-core SpaceMIT K1 system on a chip, which has eight 64-bit X60 RISC-V cores here clocked at up to two gigahertz. The K1 is also the same chip that powers the Banana Pi BPI F3, which we looked at on the channel fairly recently, and it has an IMG BXE232 GPU clocked at 819 MHz, and we also have two tops of AI computing power. In this particular model of a DC Roma 2, we then have 16 gigabytes of low power DDR4X RAM and a one terabyte SSD. And if you're wondering about the price, because there are so many options available, let's go over to the Deep Computing website. Here we are on the laptops page. And if we click on Shop Now, we can see all the different permutations, which currently start with a price of $400 for a laptop using a 32 gigabyte TF card as storage and with eight gigabytes of RAM. But if we change that to a one terabyte SSD, it goes up to $500. And if we go up to 16 gigabytes of RAM, we go to $600. And then if we scroll down here, we could also see the standard development toolkit, that thing we saw in the bag earlier. This includes TF or microSD cards with Debian and Ubuntu server images and various cables, which have purposes we'll see in a second. And that also increases the price a little bit. If we click on development toolkit, that takes the total price up to $650. But of course you could reduce it by going down to 8 gigabytes of RAM, etc. Anyway, back with the laptop itself, let's continue with its specifications, which include an overall weight of a 1.36 kilograms, up to 8 hours of battery life, and wireless networking with Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2. Next, on the right edge, we have a Type-A USB 3 port, we have a 3.5mm headphone socket, hurrah, we have two USB-C ports, one of which offers a display output. We have a micro SD or a TF card slot, and we have an inset reset button. Meanwhile, 
On the left edge, there's another Type-A USB 3 port, a recessed fast boot button, and most interestingly, what's called a development interface. And this is basically an 8-pin GPIO connector, giving us connectivity including UART, I2C, and PWM. And this is, I think, a very interesting thing to have on a development laptop. And it's clearly what the development toolkit we saw earlier is for, as this contains quite a few different leads, including leads which will plug into the development interface, both a jumper lead like this, male to male, but also a jumper lead with crocodile clips on the end, and a USB lead which can be wired up to make a UART connection. Other than what we've already noted on the two sides, there are no other connectors on the laptop. There's nothing underneath, of course. There's nothing on the back of the front, which is uh, pretty common these days. But of course, if we open things up, there is more to see inside. We have a, a decent sized trackpad. We have a low travel keyboard, which seems to be a pretty decent. And uh, I'm particularly pleased to see that we have four full size cursor keys, as these are so rare these days. And it's also really cool that the super key has a RISC-V logo, which I think is an extremely nice touch. Finally, the display is 14-inch IPS with a resolution of 1920 by 1080 refreshed at 60 Hz. And so all that we would reasonably expect on a decent laptop is included on the DC Roma RISC-V Laptop 2. The DC Roma 2 comes with the Ubuntu 23.10 desktop Linux distro pre-installed. And given that this has just reached end of life, I asked Deep Computing about it, who confirmed that there will soon be an upgrade to another version of Ubuntu. However, they were not in a position to share details until an official announcement has been made. So, this point noted, let's turn on the power, and uh, here we go. I have not booted this laptop before. This is absolutely the first time I've turned it on. I hope I've got the screen brightness to uh, movie lighting ratio about right, but let's see what happens. And yes, something is coming alive, and it looks like you can see that on camera. Very exciting, booting up a mobile RISC-V device. We've come a long way with RISC-V for end-user computing in the last few years, haven't we? It's very impressive. And I think we'll just use the magic of filmmaking to speed forward a little bit in time. And there we are. We're welcome to Ubuntu 23.10. We can start a setup. And I'll just uh, quickly speed on through. And there we are. We're all ready to start using Ubuntu on this RISC-V laptop. And I didn't get Wi-Fi connected. I think it was probably me getting my uh, password wrong and I got stuck in the middle of the wizard. So I plugged in a USB 3.0. Ethernet connector, but I'll sort that out later. And yes, here we are running RISC V Ubuntu. And so I think I'm not going to take a look around, change scaling a bit so we can see things better on video, and I'll come back to you after that. Greetings, here I am back again, and I can report that Ubuntu works very nicely on this RISC-V laptop. And I've sorted out Wi-Fi, the problem was me entering the run password, I'm sure, during setup, Wi-Fi works absolutely fine. So let's just launch an application, give you a feel of the speed of this system. There's sometimes a bit of a lag as we saw there, you have to be slightly patient, but there's no doubt at all you can get work done on this laptop. It comes with all the usual pre-installed applications, you normally get pre-installed in Ubuntu, if you see what I mean, all of these and uh, all of these, and they include Solitaire, which is uh, excellent, although I think we'll run up the system monitor because you're probably more interested in that. Here is the uh, system monitor. We can see our eight CPU cores doing their thing. We're using one and a half gigabytes of memory, but then we've got 16 gigabytes of memory, so the operating system will grab lots of it because we've got so much available. Anyway, that was the system monitor, and I think we should also run up maybe LibreOffice Writer, just to prove you could do office work on this system. Again, we'll have a little wait for it to come up, but it's not too bad. It'll come up perfectly happily. It never likes coming up when we're watching, does it? But we're going to continue watching. Come on, LibreOffice Writer, you can do it. And uh, there it is. We've gone into LibreOffice Writer, where I'll type hello, as I always do, 
and I'll make it very large in my usual very simple word processor test. There we are, we've proved you could do office work with no problems at all on this system. This said, this laptop is intended for RISC-V development. It is sold primarily for developers who want to develop for RISC-V. And to that end, Python and C are pre-installed so you can get on straight away with writing and compiling and running RISC-V code. And to demonstrate that, let's go back to the applications and let's launch the text editor where well, I've written a very simple piece of code a very, very simple piece of a C code as we can see there. And if we go to the terminal, like uh, that. Here we are. Come on, terminal, you can do it. That's our terminal. And let's just stick that over there. And if I just do a change directory to code where I've stored the code and list, we can see our piece of code. And if I now enter the command to compile that code, yes! We have compiled a piece of code here on this RISC-V system. Isn't that exciting? And I guess we should actually run it to prove its work. Let's go like that. And yes, for some of us at least, this is a very exciting moment. I have managed to write and compile and run a RISC-V application. So if you want to do that type of stuff, hopefully more complicated than what I've done, you could do it on this laptop. And whilst we're still very excited about that, let's just uh, clear the display and let's do an ls cpu to get some information on the uh, cpu list cpu there we are we've seen the system monitor but this proves to us we're running on a 64-bit risc 5 system with our eight space mit x60 cores which here are listed to have a maximum speed of 1600 megahertz although i've asked deep computing about this and they've told me it is possible to overclock this system to 2 gigahertz which is why they list 2 gigahertz as the maximum CPU speed in their specifications. So let's also uh, look at storage. Let's do an LS BLK list block devices to see the storage on the system, where as we can see, we have our NVMe SSD, our one terabyte SSD, and I've also got plugged in a micro SD card because I want to test the speed of both forms of storage. So let's bring up the command to test the speed of the NVMe SSD. There we go. And enter on that. It'll want my password. And I would point out I did have to install HD parameters so I could run this test, but it installed no problems at all here in the terminal. And as we can see, we have a speed of 634 megabytes a second for the NVMe SSD, which is, I'm sure, well below the speed of the drive actually installed in this system, but it's not bad on this development hardware. So let's also test the speed of the microSD card. Let's just change that to uh, MMC BLK0 like that. And this is, of course, an important test because you can buy this laptop without the NVMe SSD with the operating system running from the microSD the TF card, which, as we can see, has got a speed of 83.52 megabytes a second in this test, which is not bad for this kind of storage. Now, here I am back again to check out multimedia capabilities, not least because this laptop has a webcam that it wasn't aware of earlier, so I thought we should check it out. So we'll go across to Applications and we'll run up Cheese Webcam, which is uh, down here. Here we go. And oh, look, there it is. It's come up. It's a picture of me with a camera growing out the top of my head. But uh, we'll ignore that and click across to Video and we'll do a quick test recording. Greetings! This is a test recording being made in RISC-V. There we are, and hopefully we can play that back. Let's have a go. Very exciting. It's coming up. Greetings! This is a test recording being made in RISC-V. Yes, that uh, clearly works. Although I'm sure you also want to know about web browsing capabilities on this system. So let's launch Chromium over there. 
Come on, Chromium, show us what you can do. Oh, look, Untitled Chromium is ready. And we'll just get rid of that. And here we are on the Explaining Computers website. And the general thing to report here is that light web browsing, reading simple pages like the pages on explainingcomputers.com works very well indeed. But uh, heavier pages, such as, for example, YouTube, take a while to load in. But we'll load that in in a second. We'll first of all look at a couple of things I bookmarked, as you might guess. Let's go across to bookmarks and other bookmarks. And first of all, GPU internals for Chromium, which are encouraging with a lot of hardware acceleration indicated. And we'll also run the aquarium test that I like to run. There we are. There's the WebGL aquarium test. Let's see how this does. Loading in, it'll take a while to load in, but once it's loaded in, it'll be okay. It's only going at about seven frames a second there, six or seven, but now it's going up to about, about 23, 24 frames a second. Always nice to see the little fishes. But of course, you want to see what YouTube playback is like, so we'll try loading up a YouTube page, the Explaining Computers YouTube channel. We will accept all there, and I think I'm gonna kill the audio here because I'm gonna be playing me over me and that'll confuse me. I can get it right. Come on. You can see when it's doing lots of things together, it gets a little bit busy, but uh, hopefully I can get rid of the audio like that. And we'll now speed on through until the page has loaded. There we are. And I'll bring my channel trailer up full screen and I'll get it playing in 720p with Stats for Nerds on the screen. And here we are, playback is pretty decent. Not perfect, but 720p playback is okay on this system. 1080p stretched it too much, but 720p works pretty well. And so there we are. We've tested some multimedia performance here on the DC Roma 2 running Ubuntu. Things are certainly not perfect. I have in fact seen slightly better video playback on other RISC-V hardware, but this is still a very impressive piece of mobile RISC-V computing equipment. And it is very clear that RISC-V continues to progress. In real-world end-user application, computers are best judged by what they allow us to achieve. And so, across the past few days, I've used this laptop for real activities as much as possible. Most notably, I've spent quite a lot of time writing scripts in Google Docs. And whilst opening files is sluggish, the overall editing experience is no different to working on my Windows laptop. Along the way, I've also fully tested the included Solitaire application, which renders an appropriate level of frustration and enjoyment. And I've also booted Debian from microSD card, which worked perfectly, although in its current form, the distro offers a bit less than the pre-installed Ubuntu. And so, having used this computer quite intensively for four days, I can report that it is a beautiful piece of hardware. It has got a really nice screen and trackpad, a reasonable keyboard, and most significantly, it offers a stable RISC-V graphical desktop environment that RISC-V developers and pioneers will very much appreciate. Certainly right now, this is not a mobile computing device I would recommend to most users. It remains a piece of RISC-V development hardware. But having used it, I am now very much of the opinion that we're only maybe one or two generations away from RISC-V laptops being mainstream end-user computing devices. And so in practice, that means that probably about around, I would guess, 2026, many of us could be using RISC-V laptops. Certainly I may be using a RISC-V laptop. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.